In this tutorial, you'll learn about what are called second derivatives. But let's start out with derivatives. Let's look at this point on the function over here. How would you describe the derivative at that point? Great, okay. So in this interactive, you can make any function you want on the top graph and then slide your finger across the bottom graph to find its derivative. Now, if you look at the derivative, you'll notice that parts of it are increasing and other parts of it are decreasing. So looking at this graph of the derivative, how could you tell which parts of it are increasing or decreasing? So you think we should find the derivative of the derivative. Well, in this top graph here, you can make any function you want. And then in the middle graph, you can slide your finger across the screen to find the derivative of your function. And then in the bottom graph, slide your finger across the screen again to find the derivative of the derivative, also known as the function's second derivative. So right here, the derivative or first derivative of your function is decreasing. It has a negative slope, which means that the second derivative is negative. So try finding a function whose second derivative is positive everywhere. So here's a function that's all over the place, and here's its derivative. The second derivative looks something like this. Now let's take a look at places where the second derivative is positive. We want this to be positive, so we don't want anything down here. We want this graph to just stay above the x-axis. Notice that that happens over here, where the first derivative is increasing, and the function is concave up, or smiling. So we want this guy to be increasing, and this guy to be concave up. So why don't you try making a function that's always concave up, and see if you can keep the second derivative down here above the x-axis. Nice job with that one, that was tricky. Okay, so now if you have a function and you find its derivative, and then you find its second derivative, you'll notice that certain parts of the second derivative, like here, here, and here, can be negative. What can you say about the original function when its second derivative is negative? Well, here's a random function, and here's its first derivative, and here is its second derivative. The second derivative is negative in this region here, which corresponds to this region for the first derivative, and this region for the function itself. What can you say about the function inside that box? Right. When the second derivative is negative, that means the function is concave down, or frowning. Now let's look at points of inflection, like this one over here, which occur between the concave up and concave down regions of a function. What can you say about the second derivative at points of inflection? So here's a random function. Here's its first derivative. Here's its second derivative. So where does this function have a point of inflection? Well, it switches from smiling to frowning around here, which corresponds to roughly here and here. Notice that the first derivative has a maximum, and the second derivative happens to be crossing the x-axis. Can you figure out which answer choice is correct?
Let's quickly review what you just learned. When a function is smiling, it's concave up, and when a curve is frowning, it's concave down. When a function is concave up, its instantaneous slope is increasing, so this function has a positive second derivative. And when a function is concave down, you discover that it has a negative second derivative. And at points between concave up and concave down regions, like this point here, which are known as inflection points, the second derivative is zero. Okay, great. Now let's compute the second derivative of a function. What's the second derivative of the function 7x to the fourth? Let's call this function f of x. Its first derivative, or f prime of x, is equal to 7 times the derivative of x to the fourth, which is 4x cubed. We can write that as 28x cubed. To find the second derivative, we want to take the derivative of that again. So we want to take the derivative 28x cubed. What's that? Great. Let's see how you got that. To find the second derivative, you first took the derivative. And the derivative of 7x to the fourth is 4 times 7x cubed, which is 28x cubed. To get the second derivative, you took the derivative of the derivative. And the derivative of 28x cubed is 3 times 28x squared, which is 84x squared. 7x to the fourth was our original function. 28x cubed is the first derivative of this function, and 84x squared is the second derivative. There are a few different ways to write down that you're taking the second derivative of a function. If we call our original function f of x, then we can write the derivative as f prime of x, and we can write the second derivative as f double prime of x. Double prime means we have two marks up here next to the f. Now if we took the derivative of 84x cubed, then we'd be finding what's called the third derivative of our original function, 7x to the fourth. So the third derivative of 7x to the fourth is 168x. What do you think could be a way to write down the third derivative of a function f? Exactly. A way to express the third derivative of a function f is to write it as f triple prime of x. And if you wanted to find the fourth derivative, you could take the derivative of 168x. And here's another way to write the derivative of f. You can read this aloud as df dx. You can write the second derivative like this, with a 2 in the numerator and denominator. And you could read this aloud as d squared f dx squared. And the third derivative can be written as d cubed f dx cubed. But don't worry about these different notations right now. We'll always make it clear which derivative is which. Okay, so now that you know about second derivatives, third derivatives, fourth derivatives, and so on, which are collectively known as higher derivatives, try finding the fifth derivative of the sine of x. Let's call this f of x, and let's start taking derivatives. So f prime of x is cosine of x. The second derivative, f double prime of x, is the derivative of cosine. The derivative of cosine is minus sine. To take the third derivative, which we could write this way, we're going to take the derivative of minus sine. The minus is like a constant, so we can just pull it out, and the derivative of sine is just cosine. So now we have minus cosine of x. The fourth derivative, we can write it like this, for four derivatives, is going to be the derivative of cosine, which is minus sine, but then we have a negative sign in front. So what we get is sine of x again. The two minus signs have canceled out. 
Can you figure out what the fifth derivative is going to be? Nicely done. Let's quickly review the derivatives of the sine function. The derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of cosine is minus sine. Then you found that the derivative of minus sine is minus cosine. And finally, when you took the derivative of minus cosine, you got back to sine. So these derivatives actually form a loop with a period of four, meaning the derivatives repeat every fourth time. So the first derivative of sine is cosine. The second derivative is minus sine. The third derivative is minus cosine. The fourth derivative is sine. And its fifth derivative is cosine. So it turns out that the fourth derivative of the sine of x is also the sine of x. Can you find some other functions that are the same as their fourth derivative? It turns out that there are a bunch of them. But we'll let you find those functions on your own. Good hunting. In this tutorial, you'll learn about speed and acceleration. You're going to be in the driver's seat of this car down here, and you can adjust its position as a function of time by editing this graph over here. When you're ready, press go, and the car will move forward, backwards, and stay still depending on how you edited the graph. So for the first question here, try to set a course so that the car travels to the end of the road, down here, at a pretty uniform speed, so its speed isn't changing too much as it travels down the track. So here's a path where the car makes it to the end. But it's a bit of a bumpy ride. It's sometimes going forwards and sometimes going backwards, and it's certainly speeding up a lot. Like right there, it sped up a whole bunch. Try making a path that gets the car to the end, so it starts here and ends up here, but it doesn't jerk back and forth too much. It's riding nearly uniformly from the beginning to the end. Great job with that one. Okay. Now, as you're watching the car move, this top graph here represents the car's position as a function of time. And this bottom graph down here, v of t, is the derivative of the top graph. But what does this bottom graph represent? Let's watch the car go along the track. Notice that it's going very, very fast around here and around here. And these points both correspond to places where v of t is at a maximum. Try watching it again and focus on those two places. So here it's going pretty fast, now it's backing up, now it's starting to go forward, and going fast again. So if V of t is big when the car is going fast, what do you think V of t corresponds to? Exactly. V of t represents the car's speed. So what does it mean when V of t is negative, like it is over here and over here? Exactly. When v of t is negative, that means the car is moving backwards. Try setting a course for the car so that it finishes at the end of the track, up here, but so that v of t is negative most of the time. We want v of t to be negative most of the time. When is v of t negative? Let's take a look. So v of t is negative over here. and it's negative over here. These correspond to places where x of t is decreasing. So if we want x of t to be decreasing most of the time, how can we draw our graph? Well, we have to end 
the end of the track, so this point has to be up here, and the first point has to be down there. But between them, we want to get it so that x of t is decreasing most of the time. So it's basically going down the whole time. Try taking a look at that path and see if it satisfies the question. So you'll notice now that there's a third graph down here, a of t. x of t represents the car's position. v of t is the derivative, or the car's speed. And a of t down here is the second derivative of the car's position. What does a of t represent? Let's watch the car and focus on that last graph, a of t. Notice that a of t is very big here and here. What do those points correspond to? Well, if we look at the v of t graph, we'll see that we have large positive slopes at both of those points. So a of t is the slope of the v of t graph, and it represents how fast v of t is changing. Which answer choice represents that? Exactly. a of t represents how quickly the car's speed is changing. And another name for that is acceleration. Acceleration is a measure of how quickly your speed is changing. All right, at this point, I'm just going to modify this graph a little bit. And let's have the car go. So the next question here is what happens when the car's acceleration is zero for a period of time, like it appears to be over here? What does that mean about the car when its acceleration is zero? Great job! Acceleration, a of t, is the first derivative of the speed, v of t. So when v of t is constant, that's when the acceleration will be zero. Okay, let's have the car go again. And at certain points now, you'll notice that the acceleration of the car is negative, like it is over here, and again over here, and one more time over here. So what could be happening when the car's acceleration is negative? Let's let the car go and try to look at what happens when a of t is negative. So one place where a of t is negative is this region over here. In the v of t graph, it corresponds to this part, and in the position graph, it corresponds to this part. So now one of two things is happening. Here, the position is changing slower and slower, so it's slowing down. And here, the position is changing faster and faster, so it's speeding up, but it's moving backwards. Which two answer choices correspond to those possibilities? At this point, you have a pretty good understanding of speed and acceleration. So let's close out this tutorial with a couple of fun challenges. Your first one is to set a course so that the car is almost always accelerating forward. In other words, you want this acceleration, a of t, to always be positive. Nice. And here's your last challenge. A ride feels comfortable when the acceleration is low, either a small positive number or a small negative number. So try setting up a comfortable ride to the end of the track up here, and make sure the car comes to a complete stop when it reaches the end.